Greetings. Uh, we're glad to come to you today from the new Mies van der Rohe building at Indiana University. I'm here with John Rasick, senior lecturer uh, of the uh, Eskenazi School of Art, Architecture, and Design at Indiana University. My name is Adam Teese. I'm the Associate Vice President for Capital Planning and Design at IU. Good day to be here in the building, right, John? Yeah, it's been uh, it's a beautiful morning. The sun's coming in. It's it's a nice place to be. Exactly. We wish you were all here with us in person. We're excited to share a story with you, uh, hopefully interesting. We anticipate most of you know Mies van der Rohe and are in some ways even experts in Mies's history and his work as one of the leading designers uh, in the world uh, and certainly in the Midwest and Chicago. But we're excited to tell a story today about discovery, uh, a story about Indiana, and hopefully give you all a uh, glimpse into a project at Indiana University that has certainly um, come to our campus. And we're eager to also invite you all to come visit at some point. But uh, we'll get started and hopefully you'll enjoy our talk and we'll look forward to questions and answers later. Great. All right. So this story is really about uh, rediscovering a piece of lost art. And this has happened before. Um, this painting by Gustav Klimt uh, was uh, lost in 1997 uh, and then and after 23 years found in a gallery wall. This painting by Van Gogh also um, lost for about 70 years, uh, found in a Norwegian attic. And then lastly, this, uh, this Qing vase uh, worth about $70 million uh, also uh, lost for about 75 years and again found in a, a dusty attic near uh, Heathrow. So the moral of the story so far of our talk is uh, be sure to check your <laughs> attic or your basement. There may be some uh, masterpieces there. So uh, we assume that, that most people know who Mies was, but uh, for those of you who don't, um, uh, we're going to give you a, a brief overview of who, who uh, our friend Mies was. So Mies is uh, arguably uh, one of the three most important uh, architects in the 20th century. Um, to give you some context about when uh, this the the IU building uh, was was done, uh, we're gonna maybe step up back a little bit in, in Mies's career to uh, 1929, and this is when he he does the uh, Barcelona Pavilion uh, for the uh, the international exposition there. Um, 1930, he takes over as the director of the Bauhaus until the Bauhaus was closed in 1933 by the Nazis. 1938, he is asked to come to uh, Illinois Institute of Technology uh, and to serve as the director of architecture and to uh, think through uh, their new campus. So Mies designed, as we all know, Mies designs the, the campus, um, 24 foot by 24 foot grid, uh, focuses rationality or uh, a sense of order throughout the campus. There's two things that we want you to kind of take a look at. One is the, the courtyards in this scheme, and, and the other is the, the raised buildings. Uh, this will pop up again in our talk. At this time, Mises, he's sort of developing this idea of universal space. This is the uh, interior of Crown Hall at IIT. Uh, this idea of universal space where uh, you know, program is a little bit less important, uh, exhibitions, uh, classrooms, um, whatever could be taking, taking place in this clear story space. Um, and then 1945, Mies gets the commission uh, of this house, which we all know, um, outside of Chicago. About the same time, he's, doing, he's working on uh, 860 and 880 uh, in Chicago. So the point we want to make is that this is a really um, productive and important time in Mises' career. Uh, and this is the time that uh, Mies comes to Indiana. So now we get to talk to you all about a, a period of Mises' career that maybe many of you don't know. And that is that John and I have been um, lucky over the last seven years to be spending considerable time researching Mises' role in projects in Indiana, in particular in Indianapolis, and then in Bloomington, where Indiana University is located. Why is he here? So let's start with, why in the world is Mies van Rohe in Indiana in any 
in any way. Uh, he's here because of one man. He's here because of a gentleman named Joseph Cantor. Cantor was a movie theater uh, film distributor. That was his career. He was originally born in New York City. Uh, he starts to make his career in Indiana in the world of film. So put yourself in the, in the war, 1943, 42, the war is happening. By 1945, things are changing, things are looking up, meaning that the world is starting to look forward to a, a brighter future. And Cantor actually sees this. This image shows Cantor in 1955, courtesy of his son, Dan, who we've been very grateful to get to know throughout this project. But Cantor has big dreams. He's the kind of uh, person uh, that wants to do something special uh, and he wants to do something that is unique. And he's a lover of modern art. In fact, he collects a significant collection. He travels to Europe uh, and he becomes uh, uh, certainly a lover of modernism. We know he contacts Mies actually. We've, we've been able to dig through uh, wonderful files in both the Museum of Modern Art in New York and the Art Institute of Chicago uh, in, in Chicago. And we actually know the, uh, the, the notes that were left behind. Uh, Cantor cold calls Mies Fandro. He says, who do I want to design my projects? Well, in 1945, he wants to call one of the world's greats, which all of you would know as, as Mies Fandro. And so he cold calls him. And these notes are from Mies' assistant who takes a note from Joseph Cantor. Uh, you know, in essence, you can see on the right, August 6, 1945, a, a date that lives in somewhat infamy because of the, the uh, detonation of the nuclear bomb. And Cantor is already planning a new future for uh, an entertainment district in Indianapolis. So what does he want Mies to design? I feel like there needs to be a drum roll here. Uh, Mises' first commission in Indianapolis is a bowling alley. So Cantor actually says, Mies, I have this image and this idea that families need to come together. They need to be enjoying themselves. I want to create an entertainment complex. So as you'll see in the letter on the left, on the, left the, uh, the first project is actually for a bowling alley. We were fascinated in Mises' files. We found this uh, how to design a bowling alley uh, manual from Brunswick Bowling Lanes, uh, a new service to architects. We, we love this piece, certainly straight out of the mid-century, uh, and it was in the materials. He doesn't get very far. Basically, they start sketching out a site. This site would have been, um, for those of you who might be familiar with Indianapolis, it's located over by Lafayette Square, Ma Square Mall. It's on the northwest side of Indianapolis, roughly around 38th Street, and, uh, and Georgetown Road. And, and this is actually going to be a multi-use uh, multi development. It's gonna have a gas station. It's gonna have a supermarket. It's gonna have a laundry. It's gonna have a Mies Van Der Rohe design 32 lane bowling alley. It doesn't get very far. Cantor pretty quickly in the literature uh, moves on. The site gets sold to someone else. But he says to himself, he says, you know, I want to keep this going. I have another entertainment and actually food-related concept. And so he engages uh, Mies. But before we leave the bowling alley, why in the world would Mies have even taken this opportunity? Well, hungry for commissions. The war had just ended. Uh, work was lean. He's certainly looking at a series of problems to be solved. Many of you are likely Mies van der Rohe experts and know his understanding of how you continue to solve problems in architecture. You look at it from structure and space. So whether it's a bowling alley or not, you keep looking at it. Uh, and then this idea of universal space, which a bowling alley in some ways is quite universal space. But then he transitions to a project that many of you might know well, the Cantor Drive-In Restaurant Project. This project we now know actually was sited directly south of the Indiana State Fairgrounds on 38th Street in Indianapolis. And we love these little sketches. They likely were done by Myron Goldsmith, who at the time was working in Mises' office. I particularly fond that uh, if you look on the right, you'll notice that here's a sketch of an Oldsmobile, a Buick Roadster, a Lincoln, these very classic mid-century cars of that area. And they're trying to figure out how to do a new world for a drive-in restaurant. And as many of you might know, they consider new materials. John and I, one of our highlights of our time in doing research was finding this letter in the Cantor files. And I'll, I'll read it to you. 
Dear sirs, Mises is requesting uh, some literature on something called asbestos. <laughs> we just laugh. You know, today's world, obviously, we, we would be resisting this. But even better, he says, would you please send samples? <laughs> so please send the toxic material in the mail. And, you know, we find these things throughout the literature of some of this uh, work we've been doing to research. But ultimately, it leads to this very exciting concept. Many of you know it, uh, of the, the Cantor Drive-In. And these models, which were created in the office, uh, certainly the very unique signage. Uh, 38th Street at the time in Indianapolis was a highway. It was kind of the northern extents, if you will, of the city. It was where kind of this boom of the suburbs was happening and going. Cantor hangs on to the project with Mies almost till 1950. Uh, and basically, for lack of money and lack of ability to deliver, they decide to abandon it. But both Mies and Meyer and Goldsmith spend considerable time working on it in Indianapolis. And as many of you are Mies scholars, this structural system and this idea of universal space shows up quite often. Shows up in the Mannheim Theater Project in Germany, which uh, in roughly 1952 comes out of Mies's office. And then as almost all of you would know, the idea of Crown Hall and universal space. They all have a lineage of this problems to be solved amongst Mises' office. One, one funny story that we, we came up with, uh, or we found in the literature was that in, well, I'll just briefly go yeah. back to um, the drive-in, is that uh, he talked to a bridge builder yeah. to get yeah. these beams uh, fabricated. And the bridge builder basically said, we, we can't do it because we can't, we can't move the uh, these these beams through the streets. It's just the streets won't allow uh, something this large. So yeah, there's actually a letter in the, in the from the bridge builder saying, "Dear Mies, we're not sure how we do this." <laughs> <laughs> and to that end, um, Cantor actually asked Mies to do another project. He's interested in a residence. Uh, you can actually see the stamp there on the the left letter. Um, and what we love about this letter, and I think all of you will uh, find it interesting as well, if you read the letter on the left, Cantor is basically complaining a little bit to Mies van der Rohe. He's saying, uh, you know, Mies, you promised me some drawings on, uh, on my house. Uh, and in fact, uh, you know, he says, frankly, I don't know what to do. I had no idea that I would have to wait so long for the plans. And, and frankly, I hate to be on the fence any longer. For those of you who are Mies van der Rohe fans, you should read the letter on the right. This is Mies's response. Dear Joe, you'll get your plans, uh, your house in short time, so don't worry. Greetings. <laughs> <laughs> we just love the frankness of, of the responses. Uh, and what does happen, a design emerges. And, and this is the, the Cantor Summer House Project. One of our great joys during this research of the last seven years was getting to know Dan Cantor, who was Joseph Cantor's son. This watercolor has never really been for, been shown as a watercolor because the only known actual real original hangs in Dan's house. His dad gave him this watercolor. Uh, Dan was very grateful to allow it to be shown at an exhibit we held here in India, uh, in Bloomington. And you notice some of the early open universal space concepts, class, cantilevers, this was due to be over a, a, a pond. If you look to the right of the, the sketch, you'll notice that there was a pond uh, on this site and it was actually a farm in Hamilton County, north of Indianapolis. But after a series of continued discussions, money again becomes the drag on these initiatives. Cantor in fact writes a letter to Mies and says, uh, with farm values so high, I really need to sell the farm. Uh, the middle uh, paragraph there of this letter. And so he moves on. So the project really never becomes uh, uh, realized. What's interesting is Cantor actually continues to uh, engage Mies, but not just Cantor. Cantor actually has friends and associates in the development community of Indianapolis, which we largely have connected into a Jewish community in Indianapolis. And so uh, a fellow developer, a gentleman named Harry Burke, or Burke, we're not exactly sure his last name's pronunciation, engages Mies. We love this, this note card that was taken in Mies's office in 1950. Mr. Burke called, and he would like a couple of things. <laughs> He'd like an office building, 
And he'd like to see if you'd be interested in designing some single family it's homes. Like ordering off a menu. It's like ordering off a menu. I mean, a true developer. And we uh, found some wonderful notes through the literature. This actually from 1952 of starting to plan out uh, in a meeting he had with me. And this interesting for us, this meeting in December of, of, of 1952, the, the meeting is actually happening in Indianapolis because he had just left a meeting in Bloomington. Uh, so it had been fascinating to find. So Burke and, and uh, Cantor actually both engage on office building projects. This model, which was done by Edward Duckett in the Mies office, uh, actually showcases the design for the Burke office building. It would have been at the southwest corner of Meridian and Michigan streets in Indianapolis. Uh, it would have been a, a facility that uh, would have been very close to the Indiana War Memorial on the American Legion Mall in Indianapolis. It would have been all stainless steel. Uh, it was certainly significantly developed as a design product. Uh, and, and numerous photos of models in the, in the literature that we found, quite a few plans uh, were documented. But again, money becomes the problem. The, the literature very clearly states that there's not enough money to achieve these, these visions. But it's not just Burke's office building uh, that comes to bear. Uh, there's also a significant design that was actually released with a lot of public fanfare for an apartment building uh, up on Meridian Street in Indianapolis in between uh, 36th Street and Meridian at the southwest corner. And this apartment building, which was 12 stories in scale, takes on much more of the 888, 860 aesthetic. Uh, it was announced in 1953, which would have been a few years after 888 and 860 are kind of hitting their, their realization, but certainly significant similarities to what are uh, being done in that project. Uh, but it never gets realized. And that theme is certainly a common one you're going to hear in our remarks. Th there's even uh, announcements in Dodge reports. Some of you who might have been through the uh, architecture and engineering and building industry might even remember these kind of going out to find what's out there in the marketplace. We love this little Dodge re Reports receipt we found from 1953, kind of announcing the apartment building, 50 units for $2 million. I'm sure any developer would appreciate that price and that amount uh, of yield, if you will. Architect Ludwig Man uh, Mies van der Rohe uh, listed there on the report. He engages another developer, uh, uh, a gentleman uh, by the name of Saul Bodner, uh, and they're working on even another uh, project. These are a series of early sketches and designs for 18th Street in Indianapolis. So Mies is actually quite uh, working quite extensively in Indianapolis, working with his staff. Uh, and ultimately, none of these projects come to life. But he's also working at this time on a project in Bloomington, Indiana. And uh, this is actually the project that has now been built here on our IU campus. And it was which going, we're actually yeah, sitting, we're in. sitting in right now. So um, the Phi Lambda Phi fraternity project. So this is straight out of like, uh, you know, central casting, right? This is a group of, of uh, the mid-century, 19, uh, I think this is 49, of uh, the Phi Lambda Phi fraternity. Uh, and it's key to know this photograph because uh, if you look on the first row, the third person from the left is a face that we'd like you to remember, uh, and we'll uh, we'll we'll bring him back into the story here in a moment. But the the boys have a house on Third Street in Bloomington, and let's just say it's it's got some issues. Um, this is the house. Uh, this is a picture of it uh, at homecoming, 1947. Uh, you know. Uh, beer flowing out of a, like a, a parade float. Right out of uh, Animal House. <laughs> yeah, right out of Animal House. Uh, we do know that uh, the house was in bad shape. And how do we know that? We know that because uh, not only was Mies van der Rohe invited to come see the house, we actually know he left on the Tippecanoe number 11 out of Chicago in September of 1950. He was here uh, at that time, came to visit the IU Bloomington campus to hear about this opportunity. But we know this because there was a fundraising letter set out. And uh, for all of you who are in the fundraising world, please open all your appeals to your fellow fundraisers with the <laughs> phrase, like an open sore that won't heal. 
the problem of our fraternity chapter house in Bloomington's getting worse and worse each year. In fact, the house has been condemned by the state fire marshal. So if you want a, a story straight out of Animal House, we've got one for you. And this fundraising letter goes out to all the Phi Lamb brothers. And uh, it basically says, hey, we need to build a new house uh, for uh, the gentleman in Bloomington. So why me Spandero? Well, uh, again, revisit this idea of Cantor and Burke and revisit the idea of the Jewish community. The Jewish community in Indianapolis plays a big role in the Phi Lambda Phi fraternity um, in, Indian or in Bloomington. And that fraternity, ultimately, there's an association. There's a working relationship with me. And two of the gentlemen, Burke and Cantor, work with a doctor named Leon Levy, and they engage me to design the boys a new fraternity house in Bloomington. This is the first sketch. It would have been located on Third Street. If any of you have been to our campus in Bloomington, it would have been right across from Swain Hall uh, on Third Street, on the, in essence, the west side uh, or the left side of what's now the Acacia House uh, in Bloomington. This was the first sketch. Uh, we found this sketch in a, a, a dusty file in uh, the uh, Ryerson and Burnham galleries, uh, libraries, and archives at uh, the Art Institute of Chicago. And Mies and his team start designing the building. And this is the first uh, known floor plan of that building. This was done in uh, 1952. Uh, of the building and, and largely uh, the building we're now sitting in is very, very similar to this design. They announced the plans, the big unveiling. They go uh, to a country club of all places. They misspell Mises' name on the invitation uh, and they announce it to all the gathered brothers, uh, Dr. Levy, who's kind of the, uh, let's call it the uh, dignified alum who's kind of leading the effort and they announce it. It actually comes to life in this rendering. This rendering, which we believe is the only known rendering of the building, uh, had not been seen for, we believe, about 60 to 65 years. Um, the rendering had been kept. Uh, it was uh, actually in the Mies van der archives. Why it never showed up in any of Mies' portfolios or books, many of you have maybe even written a book about Mies van der We think uh, for a variety of reasons. It was, um, there's no known original of it, there's only a photograph. It is located in Hydric Blessing's photographs of Mises projects. Uh, it potentially was simply overlooked, but it, to our knowledge, was never published uh, and never put in any of his monographs or portfolios. But this uh, rendering is uh, one that certainly uh, is distinctive, and it certainly uh, represents the project we're now sitting in. And it draws some very stark and close resemblances for structure and form to the Edith Farnsworth House. And there's a reason for this. We now know that after our research, Myron Goldsmith, who was the uh, staff member and worked significantly on the Farnsworth House, actually worked on this project here at IU Bloomington. Going back, John mentioned courtyards and raised buildings. Uh, we see that idea of iterative problem solving show up in this Phi Lambda Phi project. One of the reasons we also think that happens is because Daniel Brenner was uh, working for Mies at the time. We uh, have been grateful to be able to dig up Brenner's senior thesis from IIT, which actually presents a building on raised, uh, you know, a raised building with a center courtyard. And so we know this kind of iterative, continued problem solving, and it shows itself in this project uh, that we're now sitting in. But it goes live. It goes into the the publicity of the uh, the world. This is actually an article from the Indianapolis Star, February 10th, 1952. They call it the most unusual fraternity house in America. I will tell you all, it would have been the worst fraternity house in America. Um, in fact, uh, we, we've laughed to each other on numerous occasions. Had I thrown John at the single plane glass, I think we would have been... Uh, there would have been lawsuits of plenty uh, in that environment. The brothers didn't have a good track uh, track record with uh, the previous house, and you can just imagine what they would have done. To, yeah, to it would have, would have been potentially pretty rough. But the first house actually gets denied. Uh, I give uh, my city of Bloomington planning and zoning colleagues a hard time. They actually denied the building permit for it on its first location because of setback regulations. And uh, so this letter... Uh, which shows the denial. We always now give everyone a hard time. Boy, 
you couldn't even get a Mies van der Rohe project designed and approved in Bloomington. Uh, but it was originally designed. So the first site on Third Street, uh, it was decided, well, this isn't going to potentially work. So the project actually starts to move in a different direction. And uh, one of the Phi Lambda Phi alumni who had just graduated starts to play a little bit of a legal role in advising the uh, fraternity on how to, to deal with the local planning and zoning organization. And that that brother's name is Sidney Eskenazi. And you'll see that on the drawing at the bottom. If you remember my photograph from 1947 of the, um, of the Phi Lambda Phi brothers, and I mentioned the gentleman who was third from the left, that's Sidney Eskenazi. So put your head that you now have an alum fresh into law school, helping with getting through this process. Ultimately, they decide we're not gonna locate it on Third Street. We're gonna go to a different location. And so they do. They actually locate it in what's known as the North Fraternity Subdivision, which for those of you who might know Indiana University of Bloomington uh, for many, many years was no known as North Jordan Avenue. It's now known as North Eagleson Avenue. Uh, but they choose a lot, actually lot number 14, which is at the corner of Lingelbach and Eagleson. It's the highest point in the campus, actually, up by where we used to have a car carillon, and they moved to that new site. And this site plan emerges for that new site uh, at that northwest corner, and we've been able to find and document this material. Hilarious. All these projects at this new fraternity subdivision have to go through a different kind of design review. They actually go through a university-based design review, not a civic or municipal design review, but one of our favorite comments from the design review was, what provisions would you make for the uh, passers-by when an all-glass fraternity house? So sort of think about that, John, you know, uh, how does that work when the brothers wake up in the morning and they forget to draw the curtain? I, I, I think everyone realized what a bad idea was. <laughs> it wasn't going so well. But uh, this, these uh, reviews are, are actually, in, in hindsight, quite wonderful to read. But a full set of drawings emerges. In fact, this is the full set of, uh, of blueprints. We now own the 20-sheet set. Uh, there are two sets that we know of. There's one set. That's 12 sheets, a, a partial set that's located at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. And then there's a full set that we now own, uh, was recently purchased. Uh, and it was fully documented all the way through construction. We love some of the details we found in our research. Uh, you know, Myron Goldsmith's name here with one of the submittals that was sent to Indiana University. Many of you would know Goldsmith, obviously, uh, not only a dignified and, uh, and uh, uh, legendary architect, worked at SOM, worked on projects that are close to Indiana University's heart. This is the Republic uh, Building in Columbus, Indiana. We now own this building. It's actually where our Miller College, uh, uh, our, uh, our Miller Program in Architecture is located in Columbus. Uh, and this building designed by SOM and Myron Goldsmith in 1971. So what happens? Uh, basically, in 1953, things start to fall apart. Money. It all goes back to money. And uh, things start to fall apart. And basically, the fraternity doesn't have the money to finish the job. But they eagerly want to keep going. So Daniel Brenner, who at the time is working for Mies and, and is getting ready to leave Mies' office and work more independently, he starts to work on a set of working drawing for for. Uh, for this project. And actually the fraternity gladly accepts uh, and they start working with Brenner to keep that process going. And they ultimately work a few more years, but it, it fizzles out and doesn't become a built project. So a couple of things, uh, we've been on a little Raiders of the Lost Ark uh, adventure for these last seven years. If any of you know where the model for the Phi Lambda Phi project is, please let us know. We'll put our emails up at the end. But we do know it was displayed in a Mies exhibit in Louisville uh, in 1955. You'll notice number one is the, the original uh, model was lent by the chapter. So if anyone has it in their attic or down in their basement, yeah, check your attic. Check your attics. Remember, that's the, uh, the model for today's story. We would greatly appreciate it. We certainly wanted to see it. A couple of things that have also been rewarding as we've gone through the process. This letter from Mies in 1957. Uh, many of you would know these names. This is an, uh, a letter from Mies. He's, he's somewhat in a bit of uh, the position of leaving being the master architect and planner for IIT. 
Uh, there's tension, certainly, in this letter. But he writes uh, in this letter, uh, if you're going to be designing fraternity houses at IIT, you should design like the one we designed at, he called it the University of Indiana. We'll let him have a pass for Indiana University. Uh, but you should design it like the ones we did for IU. And uh, we actually have uh, always enjoyed this letter because it's certainly a statement of his pride in the project that was designed for us at IU. It's been an adventure, right, John? Um, we've gone down to dusty old uh, places. We've dug out as many files as we possibly can. Here's me uh, in uh, March of, uh, of uh, 2021. Uh, in the archives at the Art Institute of Chicago. Ed Windhorst, who's one of uh, Mises biographers, was joining us. Ed's been a wonderful friend and partner as we've gone through this. Uh, here's John digging through uh, innumerable files. I love the one on the right. This is a view at, at MoMA in New York during the pandemic. We're all much, mapped uh, up. Less dusty <laughs> yeah, archive. Much, yes, it's much nicer archive. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, going through just innumerable pages. What's always been fascinating to us throughout this project is how many files were kept. Uh, in our worlds of emails, uh, you know, you just don't have the paper files. Just about every scrap, yeah. scribble, note was kept. We, we found timesheets from Mies, uh, and, and there were times where he offered to work for free. Yes. Just trying to get the project going. Yes, there's a handwritten note from Mies where when the fraternity comes into financial trouble, he says, I'll even work for free uh, on this project uh, if you pay my staff $5 an hour. And that was still too expensive for, for the, the fraternity to pay for. So where does that leave us now? Well, if we now work yourself to the modern era and, and, um, and these three gentlemen uh, really need to then come into the story and put yourself in 2013, the gentleman on the right, is Sidney Eskenazi. And if you remember from our earlier part of our talk, Mr. Eskenazi was a fraternity member in, 19, in the late 1940s. And he's actually now an extremely successful real estate developer uh, and entrepreneur. Uh, and he and President Michael McRobbie, the gentleman in the middle of the photograph, uh, they have a breakfast meeting in Florida at, at uh, Sidney's house. And during the course of their conversation and President McRobbie, uh, a tremendous advocate, uh, friend, and uh, lover of architecture, have a conversation. And, and Mr. Eskenazi casually mentions to, uh, to President McRobbie, you know, when I was a fraternity member, we had an, a very famous architect design us a fraternity house. And, uh, and it comes out that it was Mies van der Rohe. And this certainly grabs President McRobbie's attention. Uh, he works with Vice President for Capital Planning Facilities, Tom Morrison, who's directly to the right of President McRobbie in this image, and they start to do an investigation. And so the wheels start turning about, what is this? Because it actually isn't in any Indiana University lore. We know very little about the project. And so they engage a quick conversation. Uh, one thing that I want to mention um, is that people, there were drawings, as we mentioned, in, in MoMA, in the archives, but the correspondence, the letters, they were not in the Mies archives. Yeah. And that is because it things had been shifted over to uh, to Daniel Brenner. Yeah, so there's some really interesting serendipities that then happen. And we put this picture up of Mr. Alan Kleinman. He was another fraternity member. Um, basically, this had gone quiet for many, many, many decades. Uh, in 1985, one of the fraternity presidents, a gentleman named Al Kitney, passes away. And his widow uh, meets with Mr. Kleinman at, uh, I believe, actually at the funeral service. And he's, she knows Alan and she says, Alan, I've got these old dusty drawings in the basement that Al always liked. Would you like them? Otherwise, I'm going to throw them away. Those are now the drawings that exist in the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Those are the set of 12 blueprints. Kleinman holds on to them from 1985 to about 1996. He then donates them to MoMA and they become a part of the archive. That's one of the reasons why we think there wasn't as much discovery of this project is by 1996, there's less research going into the MoMA archives, right? Most of the portfolios, most of the research has been done after Mises passing in 1969. 
So we do some work. This is us at the Ryer and Ryerson and Burnham Galleries at the Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, a lucky break for me is I find the Brenner Papers uh, in late uh, September of 19, uh, 2015. They're right there. Those are the uh, files for the project. And it starts to really unlock for us this bigger story uh, and helps us understand, okay, what really happened here? And we start really getting further into the story and, and deeper. Then a decision happens. A decision happens to bring this building to life. Uh, President McRobbie and Mr. Eskenazi uh, decide that through Mr. Eskenazi's very generous philanthropy, he will fund the creation of this building. And we start to consider it in the context of our entire campus. For those of you who have been to IU Bloomington, uh, we have a beautiful woodland campus of about 2,000 acres. This figure ground diagram shows a little bit of that campus. This green pasture or this green river or creek, a uh, woodland extends all the way through our campus. The red square shows you where the Mies van der Rohe building now sits in this kind of woodland environment. And we start this planning. We actually tried the building and considered it on 23 different sites around the campus environment, looked at it from just about every imaginable angle. In 2018, we announced the creation of a new building, the, the Ferguson International Building, which is shown in this rendering uh, from 2018. Uh, and it was designed by Thomas Pfeiffer and Partners, uh, Steve Dayton as the, the project architect. Uh, it's now been fully realized. It just opened last week. But it was announced in 2018 and, and put into the context of our Woodland campus environment. And it started to give us a hint when in 2019 we decided to move forward with the Mies building is how could we relate these two modernist buildings and then also relate to a need. So it's not just the idea of the building, it's related to a need. And it becomes very apparent that our School of Art, Architecture and Design is growing. John's one of the distinguished lecturers and faculty members in the school, but it never really has a hub. I mean, John, describe how the school is broken into many places. We have several uh, programs uh, scattered throughout the campus. In fact, and, and our architecture program, which we mentioned before, which is housed in the Republic Building, is in Columbus, which is about 30 miles away. So uh, it's a very disparate school. So it becomes pretty clear that the, the building, which is only about 10,000 square feet, uh, could become, in essence, a bit of a hub building, a bigger bit of a central location for officing and gathering as it relates to this school. And so we embark on siting it right in this uh, campus. And again, for those of you who are familiar with the Bloomington campus, uh, you'll notice uh, how it sits close to, and I think my cursor will show, this is the IU Auditorium, the Fine Arts Building. We call this our, our Central Fine Arts Plaza. In 2015, we opened the new uh, Global and International Studies Building. Um, it, it starts to frame what is our Arboretum, where our former stadium was. And the, the Mies Building siting uh, is very intentional. It starts to actually then frame a new quad space, which uh, for many, many years was a bit of interstitial or leftover space. John and I are now looking out at it as students cross it in a very traditional campus-like way. And it's now become quite wonderful and it's enclosed by these, these beautiful buildings as it got sited on this location. They were designed then together and thought of as a unified whole. This cross section shows you how the new International Center building and the, the Mies van der Rohe building from an elevation standpoint work together. And then we also considered them in a site context where they work together. The front doors very much speak to each other. Uh, and if you ever come visit, we'd love to have you. I think you'll see that now that they've both been fully realized. But we got into the work, the hard work of trying to figure out how to build this thing. These are some code analysis diagrams that the team from Thomas Pfeiffer and Partners, uh, we chose Tom Pfeiffer and his team, particularly uh, the hard work of Steve Dayton, uh, to really help us realize this structure because they were working on the international building for us uh, and they have done a wonderful and thoughtful job throughout. Um, and But we had to figure out how to do this building today and still uh, recognize and honor Mises' history. So you see a few of the code diagrams, particularly around stairwells and stairways. Had to think about the use program. And uh, this shows you really the main, what we would call second floor, uh, includes a large gathering space. 
for the fraternity, this is where they would have had their lounge or their dining space. For our use today, it's it's a, a really dynamic classroom space used for lots of activities, lots of events. And then it's uh, in a U-shaped pattern, a series of offices. The, the wall modification we made here largely relates to creating a more unified conference room. John and I are actually sitting right there and right there. And we had to work through the mechanicals. Uh, there obviously, when this was designed in 52, no air conditioning, very limited ventilation. Uh, and so we had to think through all those things. And we did that. And this is a picture of uh, Dirk Lohan. Dirk, you might even be watching uh, this uh, video if you are, we hope you're doing well. Um, Steve Dayton is working with Dirk. We're in Dirk's apartment at, uh, I think he's 880 or 860. I don't remember which one of the two yeah, he's sure. in. Uh, but we're in Dirk's apartment. He was so gracious to host us for uh, several different conversations with him as we went through the plans and uh, spent time trying to figure out how we were going to come up with solutions uh, to the various problems uh, that existed while still honoring and being true to Mises uh, principles. John, why don't you tell us uh, a little bit more about then how the building came to be and and uh, kind of, a I think for those of the architects on the, the call might find this part particularly interesting. Yeah, so you'll see um, uh, how the steel on the right was, was delivered. We actually uh, did a, a painting system uh, and when the, when the seal was initially fabricated. You'll notice here uh, where the, my cursor is the series of penetrations through the steel, and that will be important a little bit later. So as we mentioned before, uh, Farnsworth and uh, this, this fraternity building are very, uh, they're connected. They're, they're the only two white buildings that uh, Mies did. Uh, and we think that that's because of the residential nature of both obviously uh, Farnsworth and uh, the fraternity. Um, and some of you might criticize whether McCormick House or or some of uh, the, I'm forgetting the name of the, the house in Connecticut, uh, are truly white painted steel or not. We, we'll open that up to further sure. debate, but uh, the reality is in terms of a pure white painted steel and glass structure, uh, these are very similar. Yeah, and, and as you mentioned before, these are these are happening about the same time with the same individuals, um, and uh, so so all these similarities start popping up between the two buildings, and we can see we can see uh, the two buildings side by side like this. So we have we have a very similar uh, construction system. Mises, as we mentioned before, Mises is interested in in solving. He's, he's interested in creating a system. He's creating a system of building. And he's constantly trying to figure out problems within that. So uh, there's a lot of crossover between Farnsworth and the fraternity building, um, where he's 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 taking detail, he's taking similar materials, uh, and, and he's working through problems. In fact, we've got some wonderful uh, notes of Myron Goldsmith going through structural calculations on the Phi Lambda Phi building and referencing Farnsworth's structural calculations yeah. as we go through. Yeah. And so this, this is an important detail, which you may recognize, uh, the steel column and to the window systems. Um, and you'll notice that the similarities between uh, uh, the both details of the fraternity and at Farnsworth. Um, and, uh, you know, that we had a lot of conversations about uh, how do we, you know, how closely do we adhere to Mises' vision? Um, you know, there, obviously there's a lot of things that we had to update and that mostly... Uh, connects to safety and and mechanical systems, um, but there are other questions about you know is this the right detail for uh, a contemporary building, um, and ultimately we decided to to we wanted this to be a Mies building, and so we we ultimately decided that that we needed to adhere to the original vision of the building, and so there's you know there's again there's lots of similarities that proportionally the 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 bays are are about the same. Uh, the cantilevers are similar. Uh, the structural system, very, very similar. Um, the, the depth of, of the floor plates, uh, the depths of the steel are both 15 inches on, on both buildings. And that 15 inch depth, I think is really important. It, that's what, in my opinion, allows this building to float and, and feel so elegant. Um, and that, but that caused a lot of problems uh, as well. 
I'll show you here, or I'll show you in a second. Um, another similarity is the uh, the connection between the horizontal and the vertical steel. Um, again, this this connection I think is really important. It, it helps that that floating feeling of both buildings. And Mises Mises accomplished this. So he makes this this decision uh, used through the use of plug welding, which um, a lot of you I'm sure know. Plug welding is you you drill some holes in the steel, you clamp it together. The welder fills those holes with with molten steel, and then everything is is smooth and cleaned up. Now contrast that with um, you know another detail, a steel detail, which is a bolt system. Uh, and you can see, you know, if Mies had gone this direction, obviously it would have a very different feel. Uh, it would not have that elegant floating feel that uh, the, the two buildings accomplish. And so this this image here is of. Um, uh, before the mechanical systems go in. And, and, and we were highlighting this, this one steel member here with the number of penetrations. There are over 900 penetrations through that 15 inch um, uh, floor plate. All of which were pre-drilled before they were arrived yes. on site. Yes. Um, the, the BIM model was incredible. <laughs> if you can no, it was a headache. It was awful. <laughs> You're being very humming. <laughs> The, the real hero of this project is the mechanical. Absolutely. The mechanical actually, engineers. there's not a lot of joke about no. that. That's actually very true. Very true. And we'll, we'll show you some pictures of that in a minute. But here's here's a, a close-up of the BIM model uh, where you can get an idea of all the penetrations that are happening uh, throughout the uh, throughout the system. <laughs> this is the schizophrenic diagram yes. of the mechanical this, system. This, <laughs> this is uh, all of those systems overlaid onto each other. So the the rat's nest of piping and uh, wiring that that had to happen. Yeah, I, I would say for all of you who are interested, this is the equivalent of a, a Porsche. Yes. You know, it's like opening the hood of a Porsche, and you have to figure out where every detailed pipe is moving yes. in a very and, and unfortunately, space. we then had to cover it with drywall. Yes. So, <laughs> so the beauty those of the building is all hidden. Yes, yeah, so if, if any of you are truly lovers of mechanical engineering, we'll have to find a way to show you uh, into the, well, we'll go to the next slide. I think that uh, that shows the interior of the mechanical room. Yes. Uh, it's just a very tight, confined space. I give such credit to the team that worked on this, our contracting team, CDI, and their sub-consultants uh, from across our, our, our uh, sub subcontracting world, architecture and engineering team. SOM was our structural engineer. Uh, just uh, Cosentini was our, our mechanical engineer. Just a tremendous effort and actually a lot of headaches. So it, it, it went both ways uh, as we went through the process. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that became a, a dilemma uh, was how the structural system was designed. Many of you might know this because you're Mies experts yourself, but the mullions itself play a structural role in the building. And until those mullions were fully installed and fully ready, we couldn't install the windows. Until we could install the windows and the mullions, we couldn't pour the floor. So the sequencing was a challenge and, uh, and became a part of the, the challenge for constructing the building. Here you see the large windows being installed. That's what they look like today. And ultimately led to how we use the building and designed it today. This is the uh, first floor plan predominantly now, including the stair in the main lobby and the stair in what originally was more of an outside storage uh, facility, but because of code, we now have uh, two ingress and egress routes. And then on the main floor, uh, our ultimate realization of the plan, which uh, is almost identical to the original blueprint from 1954. And we'll end with some photographs of the building today. This actually, these are photographs from the opening night. Uh, it was uh, October of 2021. Um, it was a great night because Mr. Eskenazi, who was in his early 90s, uh, joined with his wife. Uh, one of the fun things we were able to do is on opening night, we actually decorated one of the rooms as a fraternity room from 1952. We uh, we went back through our our dorm uh, furniture and found some dated furniture and uh, put it into one of the rooms and gave, I think, Mr. Eskenazi a really wonderful trip down memory lane as to what it would have looked like had he walked into his dorm room or his fraternity room 
uh, that night. So this shows some of the photographs. This is the main entry off of Eagleson Avenue. This is from what we would call the rear, or in essence, the uh, western face of the building. You'll notice the offices. Yeah, you can get a sense of the uh, the size of the offices. And they're, they're actually uh, really beautiful spaces. Yeah, they're about 145 square feet, 140 square feet. An image that's kind of become a bit uh, of one of the, the ones that's shown up in a lot of the press that shows the, the form and the shape right at dusk. Again, a front elevation image. You'll notice in this picture the, the stair, uh, and we'll highlight the stair here in a moment, but the, the wood is actually an Indiana Riffson white oak uh, wood uh, paneling system. A picture from what we would call the, the northwest corner. This is the arrival on the ADA ramp. Uh, obviously, we have to consider this building in the context of today's modern accessibility needs. So this ramp structure provides us that accessibility, the front entrance. The south elevation, uh, as it was that night, um, taken that night, we now have a curtain system installed throughout the building, but that uh, shows you kind of the extent of the south elevation. And then some details about the soffit and the lighting, the limestone walls that are used at the base. I think it would be interesting for all of you on the call, um, Mises' original design with Brenner and Goldsmith conceived of a limestone wall system that would have been a unified solid piece of limestone. We're, we're glad that didn't get built. Uh, there would have been moisture and freeze-thaw issues, thermal issues with that. Uh, this system actually, what appears to be a unified solid piece of limestone is actually just a veneer around a very high performance, high insulating interior wall. You'll notice the stair. I guarantee you some of you are going, that's not a me stair. Uh, we know that. Uh, that's the welcomed world of codes today. Uh, the stair is infilled with glass and we had to deal with handrail dimensions. And we certainly took into account the best uh, options we could as we considered the stairway. The, the original uh, uh, dimensions of the, uh, the handrail were one inch by one inch. And we had to uh, increase that to one and a quarter by yeah. one and a quarter. Yeah. And amazingly, some people have, have, caught, uh, have caught that yes. when, they, when they when they feel the handrail. Yes, we've had some some me scholars, and many of you might be on this call who have visited us, and you immediately say, "This is not a me stair," <laughs> and, and we recognize that. But we've done our best. In some ways, there's some elegance to it that we're very proud of. This shows you the interior setup. This happened to be set up for a class gathering. We have a large. Uh, monitor system that can make its way kind of flexibly across the room. You see the riffs on, riffs on white oak wall and the arrival on the terrazzo floor, the ceiling grid system, which is an all LED grid system, but has some hearkened uh, quality towards a fluorescent system, uh, but it's an all LED lighting system. Uh, taking on uh, Dirk, if you're on the call, we're grateful for the inspiration of a table, the table that you had done for Farnsworth. This one's a little larger, uh, needed to fill the space a little bit better, but many of you would recognize the MR chair. Uh, and again, a riffs on white oak table from here in Indiana. Last but not least, I think you'll all enjoy, we produced a video that we think you'll find uh, uh, to be a, a pleasant watch. Take about four minutes and uh, we'll play it here for you. So uh, take us a second to switch screens. Maybe a little history about the music. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Why don't you go so the, the, the music is, uh, a ch it's a cello piece that was uh, originally done uh, or played at Mises' funeral. Uh, and it was played by Jonas Starker, who was a uh, cello professor here at uh, Jacob's School of Music, which is a pretty well-known uh, music school. And Janos himself was probably the premier cellist premier. in the world That's at the right. time. So, And so we, we made a, a connection between the music that was played uh, by Janos Stucker uh, at Mises' funeral, and uh, we commissioned a, a cello player here at uh, Jacob School to, to play that as the soundtrack for the, the, the short film that we're going to you enjoy this. Thank you. 
Well, we hope you enjoyed that um, short video and, and certainly a, a cool story with Jano Starker and, and his cello piece and that Bach piece. It was fascinating when uh, Dirk Lohan uh, came to our building dedication. I think he was taken aback a little bit by us making that connection because he had actually called Janos himself and arranged for him to play that piece at his grandfather's uh, memorial service at IIT. And uh, certainly had a very nice comment about me being the Bach of architecture, very strong and powerful. And, and so we're grateful for you uh, being with us uh, today. This is contact information if you'd like to get a hold of either John or I, and uh, we're looking forward to talking to you further.